Okay, today is August the 31st, 2017, last day of the month. And what a month has been. <clears throat> what a week it's been. What a day it's been. And the Lord is always faithful. Let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound, acknowledging our sins to God the Father. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are in control of all things. And even when we don't understand why you do things, we know you do it because you're motivated by your love and grace. We thank you that you are always perfect in your justice and righteousness. And we thank you that you have imputed to us completely void of any merit, your righteousness, and we stand righteous before you because of that phenomenal gift that you gave us along with the phenomenal gift of eternal life. It's times like these that we think about what's really important, and that has a lot to do with what has been happening. So we thank you for all that has happened and pray that you will prepare us for whatever opportunities we may have to be good ambassadors for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and be at the ready to give the accurate gospel to people who desperately need to, ha to hear it. We thank you for this time that we can fellowship in the word this evening and we pray it all in Christ, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I've had several questions. Some people, I wasn't here long before people started asking, well, why Houston? And I said, I'm going to talk about that Sunday. <laughs> and that's true. I'm going to talk about it Sunday. But um, God has a reason for everything. I've heard a few people, not anybody in this church, and if you use this term, uh, you're not going to be banished from the church. But I don't like the term Mother Nature. Mainly because it doesn't exist. There is no mother nature. There is God who is in control of all things. And uh, there are reasons for the things that happen. And for us who uh, should be in tune to that, uh, he will, I, I assume he, he's going to be placing us in, in uh, particular uh, places and give us opportunities uh, that may be unique in the near future. Uh, people have been asking me, how, how can we help? How can Country Bible Church help? Well, I've got a few things to tell you tonight that might be helpful. First of all, uh, there is a, Faith Missions in Brenham is coordinating a lot of the effort to help. And if you want to uh, be a volunteer, you can go to faithmission.us, Mission. Dot us and on the home page there there's a hyperlink to uh, volunteers if you want to volunteer you click on that you give them your name your number your email whatever and they what I did is is uh, check the box that said a standby volunteer that means they don't know when they're going to need the volunteers they know they're going to need some they know uh, at the uh, cannery, which is a little restaurant here, I don't know what you call it, a restaurant, it's a, a cafeteria, I guess you would say. Um, they're going to need help there, but you can, you can go there if you want to volunteer and uh, put your name on that. I already did it, and they're already sending me some opportunities to uh, either be in the kitchen or else be out serving um, at the cafeteria. There's also, uh, if you go City of Brenham, dot org city of Brenham dot org they are putting up a website uh, I talked to some of the folks today and it's, they said it'd be up in an hour but that was three or four hours ago still not up but <clears throat> it's going to uh, have to do with the uh, staging center that the firemen 
Center is. Y'all, most of y'all know where that is over there by 389. I don't know if you've been by there or not, but it is tons of military uh, trucks of all sorts, and uh, they have 400 uh, soldiers there. And what there, it's a staging area for these soldiers, and they're going to go out. I think they're National Guard. I'm not sure, but um, Texas. I think they call them Texas National Guard. And they're going to be going out, deployed out to help folks, and then they're going to come back here to rest, and they're going to need food, they're going to need uh, some snacks or whatever. Uh, when the website comes on, I think it will give us more information. But you can be checking back with that. I don't know if it will be on there today, but tomorrow. The website is there, but that particular link that is going to deal with those uh, soldiers who are going to go out and help people uh, they said that there's already been people uh, that have gone there to try to take snacks and cookies and things like that, but that's a, like a little military base, and they have soldiers on the outlying area of it, and you can't get in there. So they have to organize it, administer it in some fashion. They're still trying to put that together, but uh, that's another thing that you can do if you want to volunteer or if you want to bake some cookies or whatever else and take there. And uh, we're going to have a deacons meeting tonight, and we're going to discuss particularly just what Country Bible Church can do. First of all, and mainly for any members that need help, and then beyond that, whatever we can do, we're going to uh, discuss it and uh, try to come up with some strategies and plans for us as well. So, um, do y'all, any of y'all have any questions about any of that? <clears throat> yes. Are they perishable? They need to be in a refrigerator? No, no, no. Okay. But hopefully they'll be useful things. Won't you just bring them and put them in the TV room over here, the old junior classroom? Okay. And then uh, w w that might be something that we're going to do, is just start collecting some things here first, mainly first for our members, and then beyond that. Yes? No, well, um, I know about my family. Uh, my daughter, I got a, a call today, or, or actually a message, and I have been contacting her every day during, and it's, it, the last time I contacted her, it said, looks like it's okay. Uh, she lives in Briar Forest, but there are some uh, houses in Briar Forest that has water all the way up to their roofs. But she lives on a cul-de-sac and has a real steep driveway. So I thought that she would be okay, but I got a message oh, a few hours ago that they had to leave their house because the water was rising so high. She went to live with her or stay with her mother. I don't know if she's in Houston. Her mother has a ranch outside of Houston. I don't know where she is, but she's not at home. And that's, of course, a great concern to me, uh, but I, there's no way I can. I'm still waiting to hear. And there's probably other people that might be in that same situation. This was a, a, a just, well, they're calling it epic. They're talking about uh, something of biblical proportions. And um, there's always good that comes out of these things. There's always uh, <coughs> suffering in it. There's multitudes of people in Houston that have lost everything. And when I mean everything, I'm talking about their house is gone, their car is underwater, and they go to work and their business is underwater. And there are thousands of them like that. I heard, heard on the way here on the radio, they said that in Houston alone, not in Harris County, in Houston, there are 500,000 cars that are underwater or were underwater. And so this is uh, unbelievable numbers and statistics. So I just hope that the Lord will give us opportunity to show the capacity that we have to love people that we don't even know. And to uh, the, the main thing that we can do to show our love, though, above giving them food or shelter or anything else, is to give them the gospel. And uh, an accurate gospel. And that would be most important. And by now, since most of you were here when I taught the series Getting the Gospel Right, uh, you should know how to do it. 
You don't get on your soapbox and lecture. That will drive them away. You just have a conversation, usually starting with a question. Then you might lead to another question. You just have a conversation with them. And as long as you have the pertinent facts in there, then God the Holy Spirit can convict them. He can, uh, because it's not our eloquence, it's not our personality, it's not, it doesn't have to do with any of those things when we give the gospel. The only thing we are responsible for in giving the gospel as Christians is to give it right. Give, get the facts in there. Faith alone in Christ alone has absolutely nothing to do with our works. Our works only get in the way and eternal life, God's own righteousness, everything comes as a gift. You see, if you start talking in those terms, I'm not talking about preaching. You might start out by asking someone, did you know that uh, salvation, that God gives salvation only as a gift? Did you know that? I'm not putting words in your mouth. You, the Holy Spirit will uh, help you form the words in your own way. But you give the pertinent information, and then that's all you're required to do. You, can, you can't talk them into it. You can't argue them into it. You just give them the information. It's God the Holy Spirit that will soften their heart. And he also makes that gospel clear and perspicuous to spiritually dead people. Isn't that phenomenal? That's how far God's grace goes. And you never know. They might respond right away. They might respond the next day. It might be a week. It might be years later that the Holy Spirit is still knocking on the door. That quiet voice because you planted a seed. This is no time to be shy. This is no time to retreat back into the shadows and say, well, somebody else will do it. We are God's army. We have phenomenal opportunity right now, and we need to be bold and audacious. We're not to strut around and pretend we're better than anyone else, but we have this great opportunity, and it's, it's sorely needed, because can you imagine how many people... Not only the people that were directly involved that have nothing, and for the first time they're thinking, what am I going to do? Who can I depend on? But even the families of people who are trying to help. All of this is a part, partial reason for why all this happened. We need to uh, make the best of it. Okay, let's get to our um, study tonight. We're in the discernment review. And tonight we're going to start where we left off. By the way, it's been three weeks. Three weeks since we were here. This is uh, August the 31st. And the last time we were on discernment review was on my birthday, which was August the 10th. So we've been three weeks away from this. But I'm not going to go back and review the review. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to press on. And tonight, we, what, what we already did was we were looking at health is one of the places where we need discernment. We have already covered physical health. And now we're going to go to mental health. And there's one more kind of health. Do you all know what it is? Spiritual, Spiritual health. And a lot of people don't even think about that. And out of the three, which one do you think is neglected the most? Spiritual health. Most people, uh, the word spirit is a, is a word that possibly has more definition, is more confusing to people than just about any other word. Uh, I didn't put it in the review, but in the discernment itself, I went to the dictionary, there's something like 16 uh, definitions to this word. It means so many things, but we'll go over that if we can get through mental health first. All right, mental health is a level of psychological well-being or an absence of mental illness. It is the psychological state of someone who is functioning at a satisfactory level of emotional behavioral adjustment. And this is by Wikipedia was their definition. And that last part really, I think, is interesting. All the rest of it we would understand, functioning at a satisfactory level of emotional, but then it says, and behavioral adjustment. 
Do you know that everyone in this life, and who do they have to do it now, adjust? That's what life is all about, is adjust to your circumstances. We all have to adjust. And it is your attitude towards God and his word that is going to determine whether you are going to respond and adjust to your circumstances or whether you're going to react and rebel and get bit embittered and angry about your circumstances. In other words, you're not doing a good job of adjusting or coping. If you don't think there's a lot of adjustment in life, just get married. And there's nothing wrong about that. I mean, we're not talking about, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. I mean, for guys, if they had a mother that was a great cook and their new bride, as beautiful as she is, can't boil water, there has to be adjustments on both sides. And adjustments can get a little sticky. So... That is part of the mental health is being able behavioral adjustments. But really when it's talking about behavioral adjustment, what is it really talking about? Mental is talking about what you think because what you think determines your behavior and how you act. Millions of Americans live with various types of mental illnesses and mental health problems such as social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, drug addiction, and personality disorder. Those are just about a four out of, when I did the regular discernment, we went through like 15 of them. There's so many mental disorders. All you have to do is go to Walmart and you'll you understand. <laughs> just go to Walmart and watch the people. Or even worse yet, talk to them. Uh, mental health disorders affect an estimated 22% of American adults each year. I didn't know that. That's a pretty large number. That's getting close to a fourth. The word, the word, excuse me, the word mentality and mental is not found in the Bible. But the word mind is used in the New American Standard Version 75 times in the New Testament and 100 times in the Old Testament. So when we're seeing the word mind in the Bible, it is akin to mentality, even though that word specifically is not used. This is a quote from, let me get to it, uh, Ronald F. Young, Bloods, and a whole lot of other guys here, uh, New, Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary. And this is what it has to say. Mind. The English translation of various Hebrew and Greek words denoting the human capacity for contemplation, judgment, and intention. Although Hebrew words are sometimes translated as mind, the word for heart frequently means mind, as in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, Jeremiah 19, 5. I'm not sure, but I think we'll get... Uh, Jeremiah 19, 5 says the heart is uh, desperately wicked. Uh, it, it is evil above all things and desperately the wicked who can know it. And the heart there is and essentially he's saying here can be interpreted or discerned as mentality, what you're thinking. The word for soul is sometimes used similarly in First Chronicles 28, 9. For separate Greek words account for, excuse me, four separate Greek words account for nearly all instances of the mind in the New Testament. They all mean much the same thing, understanding, thought, mind, or reason. While today we think of a person's mind in a morally neutral way, in the New Testament the mind was clearly thought of as either good or evil. Boy, has that disappeared today. Everything is relative. We are in the postmodern age. The postmodern age means that uh, there are no absolutes. And if someone uh, is really, I guess the term, out to lunch, if they have if they, what we would consider weird or whatever, you're not to judge that because they have their own reality. In other words, there is not a true reality. Each person has their own reality and they all have their own truth. 
So their truth might be different than your truth, but both of them are truth, which is nonsense, but yet that's what people believe today. Negatively, the mind may be hardened, 2 Corinthians 3.14, blinded, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, corrupt, 2 Timothy 3.8, and debased, Romans 1.28. On a positive side, humans may have minds that are renewed, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Stop being conformed to this world, but... Be, reno, renovate your mind. That means you are to, it, there's a metamorphosis that takes place. But renew your mind. And how do we renew our mind? Yeah, by what we're doing right now. It's the Word of God. It's this book that is God's, I guess you could say it's an owner's manual for us. And this tells us how we are to Renew our minds. Let's everybody turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We'll start with verse 1. We just want to look at this one. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... To present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. It's a sacrifice to get dressed, to come down to Bible class, or to come to church, or to live stream, to go on our website and study either the notes or a particular series, or but whatever it is. But that is our reasonable service of worship. Now, verse 2 is where we get into it. Your translation probably says, and do not be conformed. But that's not really gets the thrust of the Greek. The Greek says, stop being conformed. In other words, they are already not being conformed to the word of God, but they're being conformed to the world. So he said, stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And see, that's what happens. When you are sitting, sitting here listening to me or any other communicator of the word teach the word of God, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that teacher is teaching it accurately, then what is happening is your mind is being transformed from what it was into something new, something more like Christ. And it's the Word that does it. And when you hear something taught and you understand it, and you say, well, that makes sense to me, and you believe it, something happens up here. Actually, even biologically, there are neurons and synapses happening, and it, it, actually there is, in your brain, it's just like a hard drive. It stores information. It is there. And it changes how you think, and what you think is who you are. And so that mind is transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So if someone says, well, why do you go to Bible class all the time? Well, it's because I'm trying to get my mind transferred. Oh, excuse me, transformed. Well, we can transfer it from the realm of darkness into the realm of light, can't we? We're trying to get my mind transformed into being like Christ's mind. And this is, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says this is the mind of Christ. This is Christ's thinking. And so when we study it and we understand it and we believe it, our mind is transformed. And it has power that it didn't have before. It's like some, it's some verses say it's like the scales fell, fell off of your eyes and you can see things in a new light that you never did before. Okay, let's get back over here. Um, on a positive side, humans may have their minds that are renewed, Romans 12, 2, and pure, 2 Peter 3, 1. They may love God with all their minds, Matthew 22, 37, Mark 12, 30, Luke 10, 27. 
and have God's laws implanted in their minds, Hebrews 8.10. Since Christians have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, they are instructed to be united in mind, Romans 12, 16, 1 Peter 3, 8. Now the reason it's so crucial that we have our minds transformed is because the Bible in our lives is really competing for all the things out there that are trans trying to transform our mind and leave God out. Secular. Every day we are bombarded with information that is contrary to God's word. And if you don't have the antidote of studying God's word and being, your mind being transformed into his thinking, you don't have a chance. You're going to be transformed. See, look back over here at verse 2 again. And stop being conformed to this world. You will absolutely, positively, no doubt about it, be transformed by the world if you're not being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's done by taking in the word of God. You see how important that is. And people say, well, you know, I don't go to church all the time. I go every once in a while. And um, I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven. So what's the big deal? The big deal is that it, ha it happens slowly. Uh, little by little by little, you're going to either be conformed to the world or you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If your mind is not renewed, you're going to be somebody that thinks, well, I think the Episcopal Church is just fine. They're showing their love by having uh, homosexual pastors, lesbian pastors. See, that probably didn't happen overnight. Over a longer period of time, little by little, all this garbage entered into their mind and it polluted it and now they've been conformed to the world. So that's what happens. And we're all talking about, talking about something that is mental here. The fallen human mind is in conflict with the mind of God, but it is, but it is nevertheless capable of knowing God and of being changed and renewed by him. Now, what, what we can see from this is that, look at that, i got Romans 12 too right there. Um, what we can tell by this is that no one can say that they have a legitimate excuse for not knowing God. You see what this says? Even though humans have a conflict with the mind of God because we are sown into sin. We are sinful. He is not. He is perfect. We're very imperfect. Even though there's a lot of things, so much that is different, but we are still capable. Anybody is capable of knowing God and of being changed and renewed by Him, by His Word. But God doesn't force that on anyone. The choice is made by people. And I don't think that's being pointed out so much. During this whole storm, and I've watched a lot of the uh, footage. I mean, when it's pouring down outside, there's not a whole lot to, you can do out there. Um, and there's very few times that I've heard anyone mention God. Just a few times they did. One was some, one black woman. She was in the uh, G, George R. Brown Center. And... She was so happy. And she was just wanting for that lady to give her the mic. Because they were talking about, oh, this is horrible, this is horrible. And finally, the woman with the mic couldn't av avoid her. And she said, okay, what do you have to say? Jesus loves you. Jesus is great. You need Jesus. And, oh, she went on and on like this. And I was just thinking, oh, she was so happy. She says, you all got problems. Jesus is the answer to your problems. You need Jesus. And she was going on and on about it. And I thought, all right, that's the first time I heard that. And, of course, the news broadcaster said, well, yes, we all need faith, I guess, in these times. And just went Shh, right on. You know, just, just, she, she, she diverted as quickly as she could. And then there was a guy, you may have seen him. I think he was from 
George, you saw it. We were talking about it. Was it Kentucky? Kentucky. Yeah. yeah it, they were in a flat boat. They came from Kentucky. And uh, he said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm kind of a, what do you say, uh, some kind of, he said, are you a preacher? He says, well, uh, kind of halfway or something. I don't know what he said. And then he's, his father or some other guy with him said, he's a, he's a preacher. And they were talking uh, in a different way because they expressed themselves different. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to mock this black woman. I am extolling her. I am just so proud of her. She had something in her about Jesus, and she let it out. And it was beautiful. And this guy said, uh, he, he was talking about how he just couldn't stay there. I wanted someone to say, you know, we are created unto good works. Every Christian, every believer, and this is in um, Romans, um, no, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It's talking about, we all know, I hope you know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but in verse 10 it says, we were created unto good works. Isn't that something? Here in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God. What? Not of works, lest anybody should boast. And then uh, one verse, or two verses later, it says, we're created unto good works. See, we're not saying that because we, don't, we can't merit and work for salvation doesn't mean that God doesn't expect good works of us. And so he didn't say that, but he said a lot of good things. But for the most part, God was pretty much left out of it. Now, they were saying, we, the, the, the solution to this is family. If you have a strong family, then you're going to be able to make it. Our friends are all that. They had every remedy that you could think of except, you know, we need to trust God. And uh, that comes about because what this is saying is that anybody, anybody in Houston, the whole Gulf Coast, and this whole country, and the whole world can know God. All they have to do is want to. That's what God wants of us more than anything else is our positive volition. He paid the ultimate price so that people won't have to go to the lake of fire. And, of course, I know you, you talk about hell today. But, oh, that's not a real place. Heaven isn't a real place and all that. I was reading some of Revelation. I was listening to a tape uh, from another pastor, by the way. I was going through something, and I was just captivated by it. He did a phenomenal job. And if I wasn't a believer, I would be shaken in my boots. Because it, what God says that he's going to do and will do, we got a little slice of it. And, you know, one thing, I'll tell you this. I'm going to say more Sunday, like I said. But uh, it doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, how much money you have, where you're located. If you're anywhere around Houston, you're going to catch it. And that's what God does. He humbles people to bring us all down to the common denominator because really that's all we are. We don't have people better than other people. I mean, on the worldly realm, some have more money, but I saw some of these you know, $500,000 houses were just as ruined as one that had a little old one-story 1,200-foot uh, house. They're all ruined, and they're all experiencing the same thing. And that's one of the messages from this is that a lot of people think, well, I, I uh, never will get by, and I, I'm, no, I'm nobody special. Nobody is special. Everybody, we're in, well, pardon the pun, the same boat. <laughs> okay, so here's Romans 12, 2 again. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. You know, I, I'm, I can't wait to get into the spiritual aspects of the you know, spiritual health, but I can't... What does that say to you? If you have your mind transformed, that you may what? Prove what is good. Trying to prove anything to people these days is a tough, tough job, isn't it? Sometimes you may be able to prove something by what you say, but I would say most of the time, not so. People, you, you prove who God is and his love and his power by what you do and what you don't do and to a certain extent what you say as well. But proving something 
When was the last time you tried to prove something that was good, especially that Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe, that he will be king over the world, and that every knee shall bow to him and say that he is Lord of lords? He's king of kings and Lord of lords. When was the last time you tried to prove anything to anyone that really mattered? I have seen guys argue to where their veins are popping out of their neck and they're about ready to kill each other over whether it's uh, Houston or Dallas is going to win the next football game. And you talk about a tempest in a teapot. How many times have we tried to prove to someone the things that are eternal? When I say prove, I don't mean getting in an argument and winning it. I'm talking about asking them questions to where the Holy Spirit, he's the one that will prove it to them. That you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So every believer has, a, has the potential of responsibility, the potential and the responsibility to renew his or her mind, but very few do. Every believer, when they are born again, they acquire a human spirit. And every one of them has the potential to renew their mind to be a good and faithful servant. And maybe one day hear, well done thou good and faithful servant. Every believer has the potential to do that. And they have the responsibility to renew their mind. But very few do. The reason is that it is done over a period of time. In fact, a lifetime. It takes consistency and commitment to put in the time it takes to renew our minds. Oh, there's a lot of people out there that say, Okay, I'm ready for my mind to be renewed. And I'm going to church this Sunday. And they leave and they say, I don't feel any different. It doesn't work. Blah. You know what this country lacks among many things? Is consistency in anything. I, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times I've told people who, had, who have had family problems, especially with their children, and I tell them every time, consistency is the key. If you are consistent in giving them praise and love, if you are consistent every time you say, Johnny, no, don't do that. If you're consistent in punishing him, bam, right then, he knows, he will know for certain. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. Now, Johnny might not be the brightest light on the tree, but he can figure that one out. And he would rather avoid what he knows is coming rather than continue in his misbehavior. The problem is, Johnny thinks he might get by with it because why? Parents are not consistent. When I'm at ATB and I see some mother tell her child, no, Johnny, no, Johnny, no, Johnny, no, Johnny. I just want to go up, grab her and say, he knows his name. <laughs> what he doesn't know, or what he's not familiar with, is the sting on his little behind that will come every time he doesn't immediately obey. But I'm getting off track. Let's press on. So it takes time to renew our minds. The New Testament uses different words to describe different types of mind. There are those in their right mind or sound mind. The Greek word for this is uh, sophroneo, S-O-P-H-R-O-N-E-O. And it means to be able to think in a sound or sane manner or to be of sound mind. How many people do you know who have sophroneo? Do you have sophroneo? Do you have a sound mind to be able to think? You know, that's what, uh, I remember when I was going to Baraka Church, I used to hear the colonel say this so many times, that courage is simply the ability to think under pressure. That's courage. Because most people, when, the, when it gets really tough, they stop thinking and they start emoting. Real courage is to know the danger and to think through, continue to think, and then do 
whatever you think is best. And there are a lot of people freaking out in Houston tonight. Well, all over this whole South, South Texas. The whole Gulf Coast, Louisiana too. They are freaking out. They do not have sophroneo. And we're not going to stand up on our high horse and say, look at them. You should know better. You need to trust the Lord. What would you do if you just lost everything? Would you have sophroneo? Would you be able to thank the Lord in all things? Would you think, oh, this is going to be exciting. I can't wait to see what the Lord is going to do for me today and then tomorrow too because I don't have a clue. Talk about not being bored. It means to be prudent with focus on self-control. Be reasonable, sensual, uh, sensible, serious to keep one's head. I wish I could say that I have sovereignty. But if y'all know Carrie, and you talk to her, you will find out I'm not always as cool as a cucumber. But I would think I'm in pretty good company, am I not? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are sound mind, it is for you. Now, beside ourselves. I looked that up in the Greek. It's ek istemi. Ek means outside. And istemi, to a large degree, means to stand. It means to stand outside of where you would normally be. And you're, you're no longer of sign mind. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I'm just beside myself. You know, you know what it means. It doesn't mean that they move over and they, you know, they're still there. It means that they have lost it. And this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he says, for if we are beside ourselves, he's talking about him and his mobile seminary that was going along with him. And he's saying, if we are outside of our minds, in other words, it looks like they're crazy, It is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. Now, I had something that I was going to give you. I know it's in Acts, but my computer decided to pick it, do a trick on me. And uh, I think it's Acts 19. Uh, here it is. I think, is it? Uh, yeah. Here it is. Okay, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Acts 19. We're going to see what it means, what Paul meant when he says being beside ourselves. It means from a third party looking, it would be foolish. He's saying essentially, for if we are foolish, it is for God. And you'll see what we're talking about here. Let's see where we want to start here. Uh, uh, let's see. I'll just shorten it. Let's, let's just go. Uh, we'll start with verse 28, and I'll tell you what was happening. Uh, they have some guys here that were in the silver business, and they were uh, making away like bandits because they were making little silver um, idols. I think it's for uh, the great goddess Artemis. And when, let's see, do we have it here? Uh, where's, where's, where's? Let, well, let's start with verse 27. That'll kind of pick it up, I guess. We're in Acts 19. Acts 19, verse 27. And we're going to see what it means. Paul saying he's beside himself. In other words, he looked foolish. He looked like he was insane. And he says he, he did that for God. Verse 27. And not only is there danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Ar uh, Artemis be uh, regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship should even be dethroned from her magnificence. Now that's a load of bull. 
They don't care about the temple going down. They're afraid if the temple goes down, they're going to lose business because they're making these silver uh, little icons, little idols for this. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage and they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And the city was filled with the confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and uh, Ar uh, Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So what you see, this is a riot. And when it says that the city was filled with confusion. They were confused because Paul was making converts and they're saying there's only one true God and it's not Artemis. And they were enraged about it. They're going to lose out. They're going to lose their business because if Christians don't buy idols to Artemis. And so verse 30. Oh, and they're dragging out Paul, the people who were uh, traveling with Paul. Verse 30. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly... The disciples would not let him. You see what I'm saying? Here is Paul, and they're dragging out, and they're ready to kill these guys. They were, they were harning in on their business. They were going to, uh, it was such a riot. And Paul is trying to talk his disciples, let me walk right into the middle of this riot. They were looking for him to kill him. Now, that is beside yourself. You understand? It doesn't make sense. It's foolish. It's insane. And Paul is saying, we are, if, our, if we are beside ourselves, and that's a first class condition, like, and we are, it is for God. We're doing this because God is protecting us. We're not afraid. And if you're a Christian, you're going to do things and you're going to say things that people are going to think, well, that's crazy. I never heard of such a thing. Those are people who have not had their mind transformed but have been conformed to the world that would say such a thing. But he says, if we are of sound mind, and now they're sound mind when they're teaching the doctrines, true doctrine, then it resonates with people. It makes sense. It fits. You know it's true when it's true. You, you, you don't have to have anybody talk you into it. That's what he's trying to say here. And this is all, notice it's talking about sound mind. That's what we're talking about. Romans 12, 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to think, phroneo, P-H-R-O-N-E-O -E in the Greek, uh, more highly of himself than he ought to. Now we just went over Romans 12, 2 a moment. We didn't go to 12, 3. This is 12, 3. It's saying transform, have your mind transformed. Again, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone, who? Everyone among you not to think, that's the front end, oh, that's the mentality there, more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. Here you have so front end, oh. The first one is just like judgment, the next one, so front end, oh, is sound judgment. So if you're going to have sound judgment, then we need to think, not think more highly of ourselves than we should. When you are humble, you have sound judgment. The Bible speaks of those who are double-minded. In James chapter 1, verse 7 through 8, for if that, talking about a double-minded man, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. Now, an uns a, a, a double-minded man is one that can't make up his mind. A single-minded man, boom, he's on target, he made up his mind, he's not going to second-guess, he's not going to equivocate, boom, he's there. And it says, if you're a double-minded man, he ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's unstable in all his ways. Is there instability in people's minds today? It's like, where is there any sophroneo anywhere in the world? 
I mean, you get to where you think that nearly. Aren't we the only ones that have sulfur now? Oh. We're the only ones. It would seem. But you know, I, I say that tongue in cheek. But when you have doctrine, and it's clear to you, and you can look at situations, and people are all confused, they don't know what to do, and you think, it's simple. Somebody offended you, and oh, there's a big, uh, you know, there's a big hassle about it. And all we think of, unconditional love, impersonal love. Boom, no problem. You don't have to worry whether you're going to have revenge or try to get back with them, uh, get back at them or anything. Why? Because God commands us to have love that is agape love, which is a thoughtful kind of love for everyone. And so if you're contemplating getting even with someone or making them pay, then you don't have to be a double-minded man. You don't have to, or woman. You don't have to think about should I or shouldn't I? Because you have doctrine, you don't equivocate. I can't do it. I put them in the Lord's hands. I'm going to love them unconditionally. That doesn't mean that you even have to like them. You don't have to go give them a big slobbery kiss and oh, and all the blather. You don't even have to know them. This really came into my mind. I was driving home from Baraka one night right after I un understood uh, unconditional love, and this guy cuts in on me, nearly, you know, runs me off the road, and then gives me the finger. And my first impulse was, whoa. <laughs> That's about what it was. <laughs> I was going to make him eat that finger. But then, instantly, boom. Ah, oh, unconditional love. And it was like a wave of uh, calm that came up. That hate and revenge instantly was gone because I had a thought. I thought about a doctrine that God commanded me to have for every person. And I had no control. I, I, I wasn't able to go from uh, in a rage to just, oh, well, you know, <laughs> he's just a nut. And so what I'm saying is, this is all done in the mind. This is the battleground right here. And if you are transforming your mind consistently, that's the key, consistently. If you're having your mind transformed by taking in the Word of God, then you're not going to be a double-minded man. And you're going to have sophroneo. You're going to have good judgment. And you know what? People are going to notice. And when they're having problems, guess who they're going to come to? They're going to come to the one that they saw not lose their head when everybody else was losing theirs. When they loved and didn't try to get revenge, and when they showed discernment and compassion and wisdom, those are the things that are yours and mine or anyone. If their mind is transformed by the word of God, it makes them a new person. Sunday, I'm going to go over a, a verse that shows how we are a new person positionally. But what I'm talking about tonight is being a new person experientially. God expects it of us. He commands us to do this. So we won't have to be a double-minded man. Let's see, I don't have, I got just... Well, let's see how far. Okay, I'll stop right after this. <laughs> it also speaks of the fleshly mi mind. Now, this does not necessarily refer to a sensuous mind, but one that is under the influence of the old sin nature. And old sin nature is kind of like a belly button. Everybody's got one. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. See, fleshly means worldly. Worldly is contrary to godly. And by the way, everything that he mentions here is baloney in this verse. And yet they were doing it. I'm talking about... Uh, self-abasement and worship of angels and taking stands on visions and so forth. Was this the fallen angels or just regular angels? 
It doesn't matter. We're not to worship any angels. I, I would assume that it's, that it's uh, elect angels, but I don't know who be... There are those, I guess, who worship fallen angels, Satan worshipers. But in the context, I would think it's more uh, maybe um, elect angels. Yes? The visions and everything, this is church age stuff, right? And yeah. Were there people claiming they had visions where God yeah. was speaking to them, maybe through the angels and stuff? Like yeah, that's why I said it's baloney too, because people, right. God does not reveal himself in visions or in... Um, Dreams and <clears throat> excuse me, dreams that type of thing. Once the canon of scripture was completed, that is our guide, and that's why I said it's all baloney. Okay, I'm gonna get this last verse in, and then this is where we were going. See here, seven deaths. There, did you know there's seven deaths? You know what they are? Can you explain them? They might come in handy sometime when you're t dealing with people who have uh, association with one of these kinds of death. But that's for next time. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 through 7 says, the mind, For the mind set on the flesh is death. And that's why I have the seven kind of deaths right after this. This is one of the kinds of death. Does that mean if your mind is uh, in, on the flesh is death? Does that mean if a woman sees a girl in some kind of skimpy bikini and his mind goes to the flesh that, boom, he's toast, he's dead? No. It's not talking about physical death here. It's talking about a different type of death. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Listen to that. Isn't that great? What do people know about spiritual things these days, even Christians? Do they know the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit? They, they don't know squat. But when you have your mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, and the peace there means prosperity. Verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Those who are in darkness, those who are unsaved, cannot even subject themselves to the law of God because they're not even able to do so. How can they subject themselves to a God that they does, think does not exist or that they think they're not, that they're not answerable to? Okay, we're going to throw the, uh, the anchor out here. And if you want to, boom, here they are, seven dash right there. We'll get them <laughs> next time. But if you're interested, they're on the website. By the way, just go to the website. We do have a search engine in the top right. All you have to do is go spiritual deaths. Uh, or just seven deaths, and it, you can find it, and you can shine next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you give us a reality check through your word yet again. Help us to be humble and to recognize the importance of consistently renewing our mind so that we can be good and faithful servants. But it's even more than that. If we're not renewing our mind, then we're being conformed to the world and we're going to be in confusion and despair and misery and anger. We don't want any of these things, but if we're not to have those things, then we have to be consistent taking in your word and we're so thankful that you are faithful in giving us the opportunity. We pray that you will help us to be ready for whatever comes our way in the near future from all the things that have happened. And that we will have an attitude of humility and preparedness. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Mike, do you know what day or anybody that, that hurricane struck? Was it Thursday or Friday? It was Friday. It was Friday. That's what struck here. Hey, by the way, y'all, we're going to have a deacons meeting tonight. Y'all need to be praying for the deacons and me as well as we try to guide this country Bible ship through this uh, maze of issues that the Lord will guide us, okay? We would appreciate it. Do you know the date?